Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book, out of out of this book here, the official guide to the GRE, the third edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today is our lesson number 20. Day 3020. 3 is, is to signify that we are in the third edition. Third edition, day 20. We are on page number 169. Please turn to it. Make sure the book is in front of you. Page 169. Usually I do not write down the entire problem on the blackboard, but, but, but this time I, I did write it down because it's a little tricky one. So, page 169, turn to it and read the problem with me. Don't depend on my handwriting because sometimes it's not very legible. It says let S be the set of all positive integers n. Let S be the set of all positive integers n such that n squared is a multiple of both 24 and 108. So we have a set S here. We are told that we have a set here. So let's set S which has integers in it, which has several integers in it. The first one, let's call it n. The characteristic that this set has, the characteristic that the elements of this set possess, the members of this set, set or elements of this set, that's how we speak, members or elements, the characteristic that they possess is that when you take any one of those integers, and if you square it, when you square it, when you get a perfect square here, it turns out this number, this quantity n squared, is a multiple, is a multiple of both 24, both 24 and 108. If that's the case, if you have a set such, such, such as that, if you have, if that's the case, that you have a set in front of you where, if you were to pick any integer from the set, any integers, any member at all at random, if you pick it, and if you square it, it turns out that it's always a multiple of 24 and 108. Then the question is. Which one of these? I do not have the answers there. I'm going to put the answers on the blackboard. I thought I had the answers, but I don't. Just give me one second. We are on page number 169. The answers are 12, 24, 36, and 72. 12, 24, 36, and 72. A, B, C, and D. Then the question is, in that case, which of the following, these four answer choices, which of these following four integers are divisors, which is the fancy way of saying factors, of every single entry that you see in here? So one more time, one more time. What we are told is that we have a set S. Set S has members in it, elements in it. The characteristic that those elements possess is that if you were to square any one of them, just pick one and square it, if you square it, you will always find that it turns out to be multiple of both 24 and 108. If that's the case, then which one of these four numbers that we see here happens to be factor, happens to be factor or divisors of every single integer that appears in S? Let's begin, shall we? Let's get going. As you, if you've seen the previous video, the day day 119, for those of you who watched it, watched in in the proper sequence, you must watch this video in their proper sequence. If you watched day 119, uh, not 119 rather, day 19, day 3019 in yesterday's video, where we did the exact same problem, where we did the exact same problem but a simpler version of it with a smaller number. And what you find there is that here, what we're dealing with here, we have to find this magic number n squared, a perfect, it has to be a perfect square, n squared, n squared, such that it's the multiple of both of these numbers. We have to find that n squared, first one, the first number that appears in the, in the set. How do we go about finding a perfect square which happens to be both multiple of 24 and 108? Well, in yesterday's videos, we did that purely by trial and error. Purely by trial and error. In yesterday's video, in yesterday's video, instead of, instead of, instead of 24 and 108, we had 8 and 36. We had 8. And 36 and you will see that the process is not actually that bad this is 8 and 36 since it is 8 and 36 we said to ourselves since we're looking for perfect square which is a multiple of both of these numbers 
We will start with 36, 6 squared, 36. So 6 squared, 36 is a multiple of 36. It's not a multiple of 8. 32 would have been a multiple of 8. 32 is 4 times 8. 26 is not a multiple of 8. That didn't work. 7 squared, clearly, 49 is neither a multiple of 8 nor 36. That does not work. 7 squared did not work. 8 squared is 64. Turns out 64 is a multiple of 8. But it is not a multiple of 36. 64 is not a multiple of 36. Six, 32, it would have been, 64 would have been a multiple of 32, but not 36. That doesn't work. 9 squared is 81. 81 is neither a multiple of 8 nor 36. 10 squared is 100. 100 is, is neither a multiple of 8 nor 36. 10 squared doesn't work. 11 squared is 125, 121. And 121 is neither a multiple of 8 nor 36. And what we found is that when we got to 12 square, 144, we found out that it's a multiple of both 8 and 36. But this is trial and error. This is trial and error. There is no strategy to it. There is no strategy to it. And what you will find is that when we're dealing with a larger number, when we're dealing with larger numbers, instead of 8 and 36, if we have something like what you see here, 24 and 108, 24 and 108 and if we try to find some perfect square which happens to be a multiple of both 24 and 108 and if you go through the star and error method you will find that you will be there forever and ever it will take forever to find such a number just by sheer luck just by trial and error we must have some strategy here's the strategy what we need to understand what we need to understand is that if If, if n squared, let me write all of this down, if, if some perfect square, if some perfect square, let's write that as n squared, that's a perfect square, if some perfect square is a multiple of, of 24, 24, and 108, then that implies that it must also it must also be a multiple of their LCM the least common multiplier one more time if some n square is a multiple of about 24 and 108 it must also be a multiple of their LCM for example for example for example if I told that we have some perfect square, we have some perfect square, 10 square is a perfect square, that's a perfect square. If we are told that 10 square is a multiple of both uh, 10 and 25, then 10 square, then 10 squared must also be the multiple of their LCM, the least common multiplier of 10 and 25. Let's find out what that is. The least common multiplier of 10 and 25 the LCM of 10 and 25 divide by 5 we get 2 and a 5 5 times 5 is 25 25 times 2 is 50 so LCM equals 50 and we can clearly see one more time we can clearly see that if 10 squared if 10 squared is a multiple of 20, 10 and 25 which it is 100 is a multiple of 10 100 is a multiple of 25 if that's the case then 100 must also be multiple of the least common multiplier which is 50 of course 50 times 2 is 100 100 is a multiple of 50 of course it makes perfect sense because if it's a multiple of 10 and it's a multiple of 25 then whatever the smallest number that exists which is the multiple of both 10 and 25 which is the smallest possible number that is the multiple of both 10 and 25 is what we refer to as the least common multiplier therefore 100 must also be a multiple of the least common multiplier because the smallest one we can find and it, if, it's a, if it's a multiple of these two numbers then it must also be a multiple of the smallest multiplier of these two if, it's, if this is multiple of 10 and 25 it must also be a multiplier of the smallest number that we can find which is the multiple of these two makes perfect sense which is what we're going to do here we're going to find the least common multiplier of 24 and 108 and then we're going to work on and then we're going to work on finding the perfect square let's see what happens let's see what happens okay this is just a repeat of what we see here so I'm going to erase it because we need the room 
So we have 24 and 108. And we are trying to find the least common multiplier of these two numbers. They have a common common factor of 2. That's the least prime factor. 2. Divide 12 by 2. We get 24 by 2. Or 2 we get 12. And 10 has 5 twelves and 8 has 4 twelves. Again, they are prime numbers. Let's divide by 2 one more time. We get a 6 here. 5 has 2 twelves. 5 has 2 twos. 2 twos are 4. After we take away 4 from the 5, we have a remainder of 1. 1 goes and joins the 4 and becomes 14. And 14 has 7 twos. We have a 6 and a 27. We can't do 2 anymore. Let's try 3. We're going to get 2 and a 9. There we go. Let's make a note of it. Let's make a note of the fact that the LCM, let's make a note of the fact that LCM is, I need the room. As always, we are looking for room. Let's put the bottom here for the time being. LCM is equal to 2 times 2, 2 times 2, times 3, times 2, times 3, or times 9. Are you with me? Let's put it on top here. The least common multiplier of 24 and 108 is this. 2 times 2 times 3 times 2 times 9. Watch what happens. Watch what happens, okay? But this would not do the job. We are looking for some perfect square. We are looking for some perfect square which happens to be a multiple of 24 and 108. This number that we see here, whatever this, that is, the least common multiplier, the least common multiplier of 24 and 108, we know is a multiple of both of these things. This quantity is a multiple of 24 and 108. But it's not a perfect square. We need a perfect square. What we find is that this guy works. This is just, just a 2 square. What we find is that this guy works. That's just a 3 square. But this is not a perfect square. This is not a perfect square. It's just a 6. We need to make it a perfect square. How are we going to make it a perfect square? By multiplying by 6. Voila. That's what we are looking for. That's what we are looking for. Our first entry is going to be this. This is a perfect square. So, 2 times 6 times 3. 2 times 6 is 12. 12 times 3 is 36. So there you go. This is simply 36 squared. Again, what it is, we don't have to worry about it. It's 36 squared. How did we get 36 squared? Because 2 times 6, which we we're looking for n, so we take a square root of the whole thing. Well, actually, n squared is 36 squared. Do you understand? So, 2 times 6 is 12. 12 times 3 is 36, and 36 is squared, because everything is being squared. There you, there's your first entry. Now we found, we just found, the first entry in our set. The first entry in our set is, we need to erase this thing. I'm going to erase all of this thing, we're done with it. Our set S that we're looking for, our set S that we're looking for, the first entry is going to be 36. And our n squared here is, as you can clearly see, is 36 squared. What's the next one? Well, well, what we have to understand is that, if this guy, 36 square, is a multiple of, if this 36 square is a multiple of 24 and 108, which it is, we know that, we know that, if this number is a multiple of these two, then so must be, so must be 2 times 36, which is going to give you, n squared is going to be 2 squared times 36. The next one is going to be 3 times 36, which is going to give you 9 times 36, and so on and so forth. All of these numbers, all of these integers, 36, 2 times 36, whatever that is, 72, 3 times 36, 4 times 36, all of these numbers possess such a quality that when you square them, when you square 36, when you square 2 times 36, you get 2 squared times 6 is 36 is squared. When you square this thing, we get 3 squared, it should be 36 squared. 3 squared times 36 squared. All of these integers that you see in set S possess quality and characteristics that when you square these numbers, 36 becomes 36 squared, 30, 2 times 36 becomes 2 squared times 36 squares, 3 times 36 becomes 3 squared times 36 squared, so on and so forth. They possess a quality that when you square their entry, these are multiple of these two numbers. And we found the set. The set is made up of these numbers. Now we can answer our question. The question was, which of these following, which of these following 
are factors of everything that appears in the set. Not just one or two elements, but everything. We have to make sure that whichever answer we pick has to be a factor of every single thing that appears in the set. And the set goes on for ever and ever till infinity. How are we going to do that? Well, it's very simple. We just have to look at the first one. If something is a if, if 36, if something out of these here is a factor of 36, then that something must also be a factor of 2 times 36. For example, 12. 12 is a factor of 36. Well, if 12 is a factor of 36, then 12 must also be a factor of 2 times 36. Because 12 is just 3 times, 3, 3 times 12 is 36. Here it's going to be 6 times and so forth. If, if, if 12 is a factor of 36, 12 is also going to be a factor of 2 times 36 and 3 times 36 and forever and ever. We don't have to check every one of them. We just have to check the first one. If it's a factor of the, if this number is a factor of first number, it is going to be also a factor of everything else up here that appears in the set because everything else is simply the multiple of this first number. Is 24, is 24 a factor of 36? The answer is no. 24 is not. Is 36 a factor of 36? Of course, 36 is a factor of 36, and 36 is also going to be a factor of 2 times 36. 36 is also going to be a factor of 3 times 36, and so on and so forth. Is 72 a factor of 36? 72 is not a factor of 36. 72 is a multiple of 36. 72 is a multiple of 36, not a factor. That's it, we're done. The answers are A and C. Answers are A and C. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Next problem. Next problem. Next problem appears in the next on the on the following page. Turn to it, please. Page number one hundred and seventy. Number fifteen, page one seventy. By the way. These, these problems that we are solving just now, problem number 14 and 15, are the exact same problem that appeared, that have already appeared in the first and the second edition of the GRE. I'm holding in my hand the first edition. If you're interested in watching the original solution, where I go into a lot more details and it goes at a much slower pace, if you find that that, that is what you're looking for, a slow explanation, a detailed explanation, you will find the solutions to the, to, to the problems that we're doing just now uh, from the first edition on day number 66 and 67. Just type in GRE Math Day 66 and you will find problem number 14 that we just finished and then type in GRE, GRE Math Day 67 and you will find the solution to the problem that we are about to do, number 15. Let's take a look at it. In number 15, in number 15 they find penguin, two different kind of penguin and they have weird strange name. A strange name. So instead of talking about penguins we're going to talk about the entire problem in terms of male and female. In terms of male and female. As long as you have the book in front of you, you will follow me. So don't worry about penguin. Let's talk about male and female. So what we're told is that the range for females is 13.2. Range for males, we're told, is 15.4. 15.4. question is, which of the following statements, A, B, or C, we are given, we are given three statements, it says which of the following statements, A, B, or C, individually, individually provides sufficient information to establish the range for all. We know what the range is for females, the range for female is 13.6, range for male we are told is 15.6, 15.4, out of the three statements that we have there, statement A, statement B, and statement C, we must look at each one of these statements separately and independently. We cannot combine information from two or three uh, statements together to figure out the range. Question is, which of, this th which of the following three statements provide enough information independently to establish the range when they are all put together, the male and female, or in the book they talk about two different kind of penguins. Let's see what we can do, shall we? But we know the range for female is 13.2. So here is our shortest female and here is our tallest female. Let's call the shortest, this is our shortest female, shortest female. Let's call her F. 
If the height of the shortest female is f inches, whatever it is, whether it's inches or centimeter, doesn't matter. The unit doesn't matter. If the height of the shortest female is f inches, the height of the tallest female, this is the tallest female, must be whatever this height is, the shortest female, plus the range, which we're told is 13.2. We're not going to worry about a point 0.2, don't worry about a point 0.2, it, it makes no difference, let's just pretend it's 13. In other words, the tallest female is 13 inches taller than the shortest female. That's the range. Let's look at the male. The male, the range is 15. So the male, the range is 15. From here, shortest male to long, the tallest male, there is the shortest male. Let's call him M, M inches, he's M inches tall. And here's the tallest female. And he is 15 inches taller than the shortest male because the range for male is 15 inches. What we don't know is, what we don't know is, this is the part we do not know. What we don't know is, what is the overlap? What is this overlap? Because it is quite possible, it is quite possible that the tallest female, that the tallest female is actually taller than some of the shorter males. There might be few, few of the shorter males and she is taller, the tallest female is taller actually than the shortest male. But for our purposes, that's not going to play any role at all. That, that makes no difference. We're not interested in that. We want to find out the range for all of them combined. And we have done so. Here it is. It goes all the way from F to M plus 15. To M plus 15. But what else do we know? Is there anything that they tell us? Is there anything that they tell us in the three statements? Let's look at the first statement. In the first statement they tell us that the tallest person in the island, listen very carefully, the tallest person, I don't know where I came up with the island, the tallest, the tallest penguin, not a person, tallest penguin, tallest person, is 5.8 inches taller than the tallest female. Oh, there you go. This guy, we are told, is six inches taller than her. The tallest male is the tallest male. Tallest male is six inches taller than the tallest female. That's what it says in statement A. One more time I'm gonna read it to you. It said the tallest male is 6 inches. That's a 5.8. I just made it 6 because it's easier. 6 inches taller than the tallest female in the, on the island. But what can we do with it? We know the tallest guy is 6 inches taller than the tallest female. The tallest female is tallest female is 13.6 which means the tallest guy instead of writing it like this, this tallest guy we are told, this tallest guy we are told is 6 inches taller than this lady. But the height of the tallest female is f plus 13. And the tallest male is 6 inches taller than that. The tallest male is 6 inches taller than that. The fact that the tallest male is 15 inches taller than the shortest male, it plays no role here. That's it, we're done. The answer is yes. Statement A is sufficient to figure out the range. Why? Because here's the range. Here's the range. It goes all the way from f to f plus. 13 plus 6 is 19. There you go. It goes all the way from F to F plus 19. The range of all the people put together, the range of their height is 19 inches. In other words, the difference between the shortest person, male or female, and the tallest person, male or female, is 19 inches. <coughs> the shortest person is 19 inches shorter than the, than the tallest person to put together, everything everybody put together, but the tallest person is 19 inches taller than the shortest person. There you go. Statement 1, statement A works. In statement B, in statement B, they talk about, I'm going to read to you one more time, you must have the book in front of you. It says the median of male is 1.1 inches more than the median of the female. It talks about median. It talks about median. And statement C talks about the average, the mean. The median and mean will not tell us 
anything at all about the range. Why? Because median and mean are used, median, mean and mode. Even if they had told us something about the mode, it wouldn't have helped. Because these three measurements that we, that we see here, median, median, mean and mode, they tell us about, they, are, they give us some idea about the central tendency. Central tendency is just a very fancy way of saying, where do the data tend to cluster? Well, the data tend to cluster generally around the mean. Data tends to cluster. If, you, if I know the mode, that will give me some idea of where the data is clustered, because mode is the most frequently appearing observation. They will cluster around that area. Or if you tell me the median, that gives me some idea of, of how the data is clustered, because median is right in the middle, 50% are below, and 50% of the observations are above it. So they tend to cluster around there. Mean, median, and mode are measurements of central tendency. They are not measurement of dispersion. They are not measurement of dispersion. And that's what we're talking about here. Range. And what else do we use to measure dispersion? And standard deviation. They are measurements of dispersion. Range tells us how dispersed the observations are because it tells us, it gives us some idea because we know the smallest value, we know the la largest value, it tells us how, they, how much observations are dispersed. If you want to be fancy, if you want to do some calculation, if you're going to be more sophisticated, you can take the time to do the calculation for standard deviation and that tells us how they are dispersed. The standard deviation tells us how they are dispersed because if I know, if we know the standard deviation, we can very quickly, I'm going to erase this part so we can have some little bit more room. If we know the dispersion, or rather if we know the standard deviation, we can see how they are dispersed because we know, this is our mean, we know that within one standard deviation, within one standard deviation, two-thirds of the observations will be clustered. We also know that within two standard, within two standard deviation, from the mean to two standard deviation lower, two standard deviation lower, in this, in this area right here, we will cover, we will capture virtually everyone. 95% of the observations are going to fall between the two, two standard deviation. Two standard deviation above the mean and two standard deviation below the mean. If you go, you will capture 95% of the observation. It tells us how, how dispersed the observation, how, how dispersed the observation are. These are measurement of dispersions. Range and standard deviations are measurement of dispersions. They do, uh, whereas, whereas mean, median and mode, they measure central tendency. So answer choice B, answer choice B is going to tell us nothing at all about the range. Median has nothing to do at all about the range. Answer choice C is not going to tell us anything at all. Answer choice C, no matter how much information you give me about the mean, we will not be able to figure out the range because there are two different animals. One talks about the central tendency, the other is a measurement of dispersion. We are interested in range. We are interest, inter, inter, interested in measuring the range of these observations. And knowing the mean or the mode or the median will not help. Answer choice B and C are worthless. Answer choice A was useful. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.